In this lesson, we will review conic sections, which is a topic you probably saw in an earlier course. A conic section, or a conic, can be described as the intersection of a plane with a double napped cone. When the plane passes through the vertex, the result is called a degenerate conic. So if you have a plane that does not pass through the vertex, you're going to get either a circle, if that plane is parallel to the vertex, an ellipse, if it's a little cattywampus, a parabola up there, and then a hyperbola, if it intersects both parts of the cone. So that's one way of defining a conic section. We are going to define conic sections that satisfy a certain geometric property. The best way to illustrate that is with an example, with the circle, that's the easiest example. So how might you define a circle? So a circle is all points x, y that are a fixed distance r from a center point H, K. So you have your center point and all the points that are a fixed distance are away. So what you apply now is the distance formula that says the distance between two points is given by x2 minus x1 squared plus y2 minus y1 squared. This formula effectively is just the Pythagorean theorem. Now, between any point x, y, and h, k, we'll have x minus h squared plus y minus k squared is equal to a fixed distance r. And then squaring both sides, we get x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. That's the formula for the a circle with center h, k, and radius r. So in an equation for a circle of radius 5, centered at negative 2, 1, will be given by x minus negative 2, so x plus 2 squared, plus y minus 1 squared, equals 5 squared, or 25. circle is the simplest conic section. The next conic section we're going to discuss is the parabola. So a parabola is the set of all points x, y that are equidistant from a fixed line called the directrix and a fixed point called the focus not on the line. The midpoint between the focus and directrix is the vertex and the line passing through the focus and vertex is the axis of symmetry of the parabola. So, by definition, this distance is equal to that distance. And if you go from your focus out to your parabola and then down to your directrix, this and this must be of equal length. And this definition gives us these forms of the equations of a parabola we have x minus h squared equals 4p times y minus k. That's if we have a regular parabola with a vertical axis of symmetry. And if we have a sideways parabola, it's y minus k squared equals 4p x minus h. So one question is where the heck does that 4 come from? So I can show you where it comes from in the case of a parabola that's centered at, has vertex at the origin. And from that, you can just translate it to get the vertex shifted to a point hk. So, let's start with a parabola that has a vertex at 0, 0. The directrix will be at we'll say p units down, so that's negative p, and there's the focus, which is p units up, and the focus has coordinates 0, p. 
Now let's suppose we have some other point x x comma y on the parabola. Using the distance formula, the distance between these points, we'll call that point the point that is the focus F and this other point we're just going to call capital P. Now the distance between those points from P to F is given by x2 minus x1, so x minus 0 squared, so x squared, plus y minus p, the quantity squared. And by definition, this distance has to equal the distance down to the directrix. Pretend for a second that I can actually draw. And this distance is y, and this distance is p. So this pf distance is given by the absolute value of y plus p is equal to the root of x squared plus y minus p, the quantity squared. Now what we're going to do here is square both sides. So expanding that out, on the left we'll have y squared plus 2py plus p squared equals x squared plus y squared minus 2py plus p squared. And if we get all the y's on the left and the x's on the right, you can see that the y squareds will cancel, and the p squareds will cancel. And when I add this negative 2py to this side, I get 4py equals x squared. So in this case, p is the distance from the vertex to the directrix or from the vertex to the focus. And if you solve it for y, you'll have y equals 1 over 4px squared, which is sort of the normal equation you think of for a parabola. You think of that 1 over 4p as being a, which means if p is negative, your parabola opens downward. If p is positive, your parabola opens upward. So we're going to use this equation to graph some parabolas. Find the length of the lattice rectum of the parabola given by the equation x squared equals 4py. Then find the length of the parabolic arc intercepted by the lattice rectum. So what we're looking for here is the length of that thing. So this distance is p, and this distance is p. So supposing that we do indeed have the parabola x squared equals 4p, why we know the vertex is at 0, 0. So right here we have the x-axis. And in that case, this point has a y-coordinate of p, and this point has a y-coordinate of p because they're the same height as the focus. So we know that y equals p, and let's insert that in this equation. x squared will equal 4p times p, or x squared equals 4p squared. And then rooting, we have x equals plus or minus 2p. So if you know that the distance from the vertex to the focus is p, the distance from the focus out to the parabola is 2p. So the length of that lattice rectum is equal to 2p plus 2p, or 4p. And we're going to use that when we draw when we sketch some parabolas in the next examples. Now the length of a parabolic arc, so how long is that arc? That will be given by an integral from negative 2p to 2p root 1 plus y prime squared 
dx, that's the arc length formula. And because the length of the arc on the left side of the vertex is the same as the right side of the vertex, we can do twice the integral from 0 to 2p, root 1 plus, all right, y prime here, so y would equal x squared over 4p, so y prime is 2x over 4p, or x over 2p. So you have 1 plus x over 2p squared dx. So that's twice the integral from 0 to 2p root 1 plus x squared over 4p squared dx. And getting a common denominator, we have 2 times the integral 0 to 2p root 4p squared plus x squared all over 4p squared. When you factor out that 4p squared, it roots and becomes 2p, and we end up with 1 over p times the integral from 0 to 2p root 4p squared plus x squared dx. This integral is really, really tricky to integrate. Your textbook actually uses an integration formula to figure out what it is. I think you can derive it using a trig substitution. That's not the point. The point is, can you set up an integral that would find the length of that curve? At this point, it's good enough. This is approximately equal to 4.59 times p. And that should make sense that this has a length that is greater than the lattice rectum. Find the vertex, focus, and directrix of the parabola, and then sketch its graph. So first, I'm going to put this in the form x minus h squared equals 4p times y minus k. So I'll take this 8 times y plus 3 and subtract it to the right side. So I have x minus 2 squared equals negative 8 times y plus 3. So from that, you can tell that the vertex is at the point 2, negative 3. So graph that. And because you have negative 8 right here, you know that negative 8 must equal 4p and therefore p is negative 2. And because the x is what is square, we know we have a either upside down or right side up parabola. Because p is negative, we know the parabola is upside down. So above the vertex, we have the directrix. And below it, we have the focus. And since the distance from the focus to the directrix is 2, and we just found out that the length of that lattice rectum is 4p. We can go out 1, 2, 3, 4 on this side to get another point in my parabola, and 1, 2, 3, 4 on that side. Oops. And there is the parabola. So the vertex is at 2, negative 3. The focus is at the point 2, negative 5. And the directrix is the line y equals negative 1. For this parabola, we have to first put it in the right form. We're going to use completing the square. So we have y squared plus 4y. We add half of 4 squared, so plus 4, and that gives us y plus 2 squared. And you can't just add 4 to an equation and not compensate for it. That's totally crazy. So what you also do is take away 4. It's a really clever trick that adding 4 and taking away 4 by doing so, you've effectively done nothing. Plus 8x minus 16 equals 0. Or y plus 2 squared plus 8 times the quantity x minus 2 equals 0. So once again, let's get it in that form where the 
y plus 2 squared is on the left side equals negative 8 x minus 2. So this parabola is sideways because the y is what is squared. So here the vertex is at the point 2, negative 2. So you go over 2, down 2. It's going to open to the left because of the negative 8. And we have negative 8 has to equal 4p again. So once again, p is negative 2. So here is the directrix. And there is the focus. And using that length relationship, we know that if this distance is 2, we have two more points that are twice that away. So 2, 4, 2, 4. And there's the parabola with that equation. Now let's just give the equations for the focus and the directrix. So the focus is the point 0, negative 2. And in this case, the directrix is, the, is a vertical line. x equals negative 4. Next, let's sort of reverse this process. This time, I'll tell you what the vertex and focus are, and you need to get me the equation of the parabola. So the vertex is at 5, 4. So I think it's easiest to actually just kind of sketch a graph of this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. And the focus is at 3, 4. So this means that I have to have a one, two, a sideways parabola like this. So my general form will be y minus k squared equals 4p x minus h. So the vertex tells us k and h. We know that h is equal to 5 and k is equal to 4. And since the distance from the focus to the vertex is 2, we also know that p is equal to 2. So that gives us the equation y minus 4 squared equals 8 times x minus 5. And because the parabola opens to the left, we also need to make this a negative 8. Next we have a focus, at, a vertex at 0, 5, so way the heck up here, and some kind of parabola, and the directrix at y equals negative 3. So since we have a normal parabola, we'll have the equation x minus h squared equals 4p y minus k. And the distance from the vertex to the directrix is 8. So in this case, we know that P is equal to 8, and HK is equal to 0, 5. So that gives us the equation X minus 0 squared equals 4 times 8, Y minus 5. And since we open upward, we have a positive p. So x squared equals 32 times y minus 5. Suppose we have a suspension bridge, and it's suspended in the shape of a parabola between two towers that are 100 meters apart and 20 meters above the roadway. So here's our roadway. This is 20 meters, and this is 20 meters. And between them, we have a cable of a suspension bridge that goes like in the shape of a parabola. It doesn't look very parabolic, but oh well. And let's call the point where the parabola comes and hits the roadway, well, let's call that the 
origin. And that means that on either side of the origin, this distance is 50 and this distance is 50. So up here at the that point, we have the coordinates 50, 20. Now, an equation for a parabola at the origin can be thought of as y equals ax squared. What we need to do is find that a, so 50 goes in for x, 20 goes in for y, 20 equals a times 50 squared, 20 equals a times 2500, and a will equal 20 over 2500, which is 2 over 250, or 1 over 125. So your equation for your parabola is 1 over 125 x squared. Next, let's set up, but not solve, an integral that will find the length of the parabolic supporting cable. So, the length of that cable we can find using the arc length formula, which is 2 pi times the integral from a to b, the root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. So in this case, my cable begins at an x value of negative 50, ends at an x value of 50. We'll have the root of 1 plus ooh, the derivative of 1 over, well, we have the equation y equals 1 over 125 x squared. The derivative will be 2 over 125 x, the quantity squared dx. And we can simplify this slightly. For 1, this function is even, so we can do twice the integral from 0 to 50. So we can do 2 times 2 pi, the integral from 0 to 50. Root will have 4x squared over whatever 125 squared is. Getting a common denominator that 1 can be thought of as 125 squared over 125 squared. At which point in time the 125 squared didn't factor out and just become a regular 125. So 4 pi over 125 times the integral from 0 to 50 root 125 squared plus 4x squared dx. This is theoretically possible to solve using some kind of tricky trig substitution. If you were in the real world, you would use some kind of calculating device to find the length here, so I think that this is sufficient. Parabolas are also used in the design of mirrors and things like solar cookers, so mirrors inside of things like flashlights and telescopes and what those devices are taking or making use of is this thing called the reflexive property of a parabola, which I'll try to explain to you. So suppose you have a point P on a parabola. In this picture, that point P corresponds to this E. And what the reflexive property says is if you have a tangent line to the parabola, so you see that there is my tangent line. The tangent line to the point P makes equal angles with the following lines. The line passing through P and the focus. So here's the line through P and the focus. And the line passing through P and parallel to the axis of symmetry. So there's this line. So this tells us that this angle and that angle must be equal. I'm not proving this, just saying that that is what is true. And then, due to some geometry that opposite angles are equal, this angle must equal that angle. And what that means is if you have light that comes into your parabola, it's going to reflect back to the focus. So that is used in design of things like solar cookers. Now, the, you can also reverse the arrows in the direction, the, you know, the light going the other way. At the focus, suppose you have a light bulb, and the light comes out of the light bulb and hits the mirror, and then goes straight out. And so this is what's used 
in the design of things like flashlights or you have the light placed at the focus and the light hits the parabolic mirror and ref reflects straight out of the flashlight. And of course in that case you obtain that mirror by taking this parabola and kind of spinning it to get the, the mirror surface. So that's one property of parabolas that's used in engineering and design. The next conic section we're going to discuss is an ellipse. So an ellipse is the set of all points x, y, the sum of whose distances from two distinct points called the foci is constant. The line through the focus intersects the ellipse at two points called the vertices, and the chord joining the vertices is the major axis, and its midpoint is the center of the ellipse. The chord perpendicular to the major axis is called the minor axis of the ellipse. And ellipses are used all over in things like space, where you talk, we'll talk about elliptical orbits. And in that case, the like so, if we the sun orbits around the Earth in an elliptical orbit, and the sun is at one of these foci. So what this definition says is that if you have these two points, and you go out to your curve, back to your point, that when you add together those two blue lines. The sum is the same as those two black lines, or this, those two blue lines have the same sum. One way you can think about drawing an ellipse is taking two thumbtacks and like say sticking them to your table and having a line between them and holding this line taut as you draw around in, I can't say a circle because it's not a circle, but draw around in a circular form and you'll get an ellipse. And the equation for an ellipse is quite similar to a circle. So we have the equation is x minus h over a squared plus y minus k over b squared. And in this case, the a, in this case, the a, if we have your vertex h k, a is the distance from the vert the set the center out to the parabola, so A is that distance, and B is that distance from the center of the ellipse up to the top of the curve. And assuming that A is bigger than B, in this first case, you're going to have your foci on the sort of like side-to-side -side axis. It isn't the x-axis because it's shifted. And if this b is greater, the focus lie on the, the vertical axis. And the foci are given by the equation. There's c units from the center, and c squared is a squared minus b squared. So find the center vertices and foci of this ellipse. So first you have to make the equation equal to 1. So we're going to divide by 100. 4 over 100 is 25. So we have x plus 5 squared over 25 plus y minus 2 squared over 4 equals 1. So the center of this is much like in the center of a circle. It's negative 5, 2. Underneath the x plus 5, we have 25, so that tells me that my a is equal to 5. So I go out from my center, 5 to the right, and 5 to the left. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I have two vertices. One is at 0, 2, and the other one is 5 back from negative 5, so it's at negative 10, 2. And then because the root of 4 is 2, I go up 2, down 2, and my other vertices are that lower one is the point negative 5, 0, and the upper one is negative 5, 4.
So there's the ellipse, and we have all of the vertices, and the foci. So the equation for the foci is c squared equals, in this case, a squared minus b squared. So that will be 25 minus 4, or 21. So c is plus or minus the root of 21. So those foci are root 21 units, plus or minus, from that center. And they're going to be on this horizontal axis through the center and the blue vertices. And their coordinates will be whatever negative 5 plus or minus root 21 comma 2, whatever that happens to be. Before we find the center and vertices and foci of this ellipse, we have to complete the square and put it in the right form. So start by grouping terms that are of the same variable. So you have 9x squared and 36x. And then we have 4y squared and 24y. And I'm going to move this positive 36 to the other side and say equals negative 36. Now factor out the GCF from each group, so the greatest common factor. We'll have 9 times x squared plus 4x plus 4 times y squared minus 6y. And now to complete the square in the first set of parentheses, we add 4. Because of the 9 out in front, we've effectively added 36 to the left side, so we have to also add 36 to the right side. And the second group, half of 6 is 3, 3 squared is 9, so we add 9. We've actually added 36, so we add 36 to the right side again. And that gives us 9 times x plus 2 squared plus 4 times y minus 3 squared equals 36. And dividing by 36, we'll have x plus 2 squared over 4, plus y minus 3 squared over 9 equals 1. So the center of this parabola is negative 2, 3, back to up 3, Underneath the x plus 2 squared, we have 4, so we go side to side 2 units, so 2 to the right, 2 to the left. So we can then find two more of our vertices. So one vertice is at 0, 3, and one is at negative 4, 3. And underneath the y, we have 9, so we go up 3, down 3, and two more vertices at negative 2, 0, and negative 2, 6. And in this case, because the we'll say up and down axis is longer than the side to side axis, the vertices are going to be on that up and down axis parallel to the y-axis. By vertices, I meant foci. So the foci are given by c squared equals a squared minus b squared. One thing you can remember is that a squared is always going to be the larger term. So you could take a to be 3, so a squared is 9. So we'll have 9 minus 4. So c is equal to plus or minus root 5. So the foci are root 5 and minus root 5 up or down from the center. So in that case, their x-coordinate is still negative 2, but their y-coordinates are given by 3 plus or minus root 5. So the moon orbits the Earth in an elliptical path with the center of the Earth at one focus. The major and minor axes of the orbit have lengths 768,800 kilometers and 767,640 kilometers, respectively. Find the greatest and least distances from the Earth's center to the Moon's center. So, 
here we have the Earth at one focus, and the Moon goes around it in some kind of parabolic shape. So here's the Moon. And the closest the Moon is to the Earth is at that point, and the farthest away is this length. So first we need to get an equation for this ellipse. Pretend like it's centered at the origin 0, 0, and just the major axis or the longer one is the one going from side to side. So that total distance is 7, 6, 800, 768, 800, and this total distance is 767, 640. And so we know that this distance is 2a, and then dividing by 2 we get a is 384,400, and we know that twice b is equal to this 767 number, and we'll have b is equal to 383,820. And so then an equation for the ellipse is x squared over 384400 squared, whatever that is, please do not square that out, it's going to be terrible, plus y squared over 383820 squared equals 1. So let's now find the coordinates of the foci. So the foci is given by c squared equals a squared minus b squared, or c is equal to the root of a squared minus b squared. And plugging in your a and your b, we get this is approximately equal to 21,108 kilometers. So this distance is 21,108 kilometers. So then the greatest distance is given by this distance plus that distance, which is the A. So the greatest distance is C plus A, which is approximately equal to 405,000 508 kilometers. And the least distance, if this total distance is A and that little bit is C, that will be C or A minus C, which is approximately equal to 363,292 kilometers. Next, let's find a formula for the area of an ellipse. So it's easiest to just think about an ellipse centered at the origin for this. So the distance out from the center is plus or minus a, and the distance up or down is plus or minus b. And so the equation of that ellipse is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. Or solving for y, we have y squared over b squared equals 1 minus x squared over a squared. Or y squared equals b squared minus x squared b squared over a squared. And y will equal the square root of this stuff. So y is the root of b squared minus x squared b squared over a squared. Technically y is plus or minus the root, but the plus part gets the top half. So the area can be given by the area under this curve, so this area multiplied by 2. So twice the integral from negative a to a root b squared minus x squared b squared over a squared dx. 
and because of the symmetry we have here, we can do twice the integral from 0 to a. So 2 times 2 integral from 0 to a. At the same time, do you see how there is a greatest common factor of b squared inside the integral? I'm going to factor that out and root it so I get a b outside. And then I have root 1 minus x squared over a squared dx. So 4b, not 44, 4b times the integral from 0 to a, root a squared over a squared minus x squared over a squared dx. And now factor out the 1 over a, and we have 4b over a, the integral from 0 to a, root a squared minus x squared dx. Now at this point in time, you could use a trig sub, or you could notice that this is a, actually a quarter circle with r equal to a. And the area of a quarter of a circle is 1 quarter pi r squared. So we'll have 4b over a times 1 quarter pi a squared which when you simplify everything, you end up with pi a b. And if you have a circle and a is equal to b, which is equal to, in this case we'll say r, then you end up with the formula area of a circle, which is um, pi r squared. So that did kind of rely on, we knew that this was a circle, which we technically didn't prove, but you could use a trig substitution to also figure out that this is 1 quarter pi a squared. That's also not very hard. The final conic section we're going to discuss is the hyperbola. So a hyperbola is the set of all points x, y for which the absolute value of the difference between the distances from two fixed points called the foci is constant. So what that means, and the line segment connecting the two vertices is called the transverse axis, the midpoint is called the center. So if we have those two line segments or oops, wrong ones from the foci. So if we have these two line segments or say those two line segments think about, and the absolute value of the differences between them is constant. So if you do long line minus short line, you'll get the same number as the line, this line's length minus that line's length. That distance is always constant. And here are the standard forms for the equations of the ellipses. They're awfully similar to or hyperbolas, they're awfully similar to ellipses, except for instead of plus, you have minus. So if you have that the x term is the positive term, you're going to have those vertices on the x-axis like this. And if the y term is what is positive, you're going to have vertices on the y-axis like that. And so in this case, in the first case, the Ma the major axis is a horizontal axis, and the second case is a vertical axis. And the foci lie on the major axis c units from the center, with c given by the Pythagorean theorem, actually. And now the asymptotes of the hyperbola are given by these equations. The easiest way to find them, actually, is to figure out the distances side to side like you do for an ellipse and then up and down as if you were graphing an ellipse and then make a box and the vertices, the asymptotes go out the corners of that box and that's what this is effectively saying. So sketch the graph of this hyperbola whose equation is 9x squared minus y squared equals 36. So first divide by 36, and we'll have x squared over 4 minus y squared over 36 equals 1. 
So just pretend for a moment like you're graphing an ellipse. You would go side to side two, up and down six, and this makes, we'll make a box, and the asymptotes for the hyperbola go out the corners of this box. And now all you have to do is figure out if your parabola is on the x-axis or on the y-axis. And because the x squared is what is positive, you know that you must pass through these points. You can figure that out by setting y equals 0, that they are actually at 2 and negative 2. So then your hyperbola just approaches the asymptote. This one's a really wide hyperbola. All right, here is an off-centered hyperbola. So start by dividing this all by 4. And we'll have x minus 1 squared over 4 minus y plus 2 squared over 1 equals 1. So the center is 1, negative 2. So over 1, down 2. From that center, we go left and right 2, and up and down 1, and then let's sketch the asymptotes in. So there's the asymptote, here's the asymptote, and now the question is, is this a vertical or horizontal hyperbola? And because the x squared is the positive term, it's horizontal and it lives in that region.